بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبيه الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. Today's topic is asking too many questions. Um, inspired by so many questions were asked every night. To understand this topic, and I'm serious, asking too many questions. The Quran speaks quite a bit about the idea of questions. And you'll be surprised, would you imagine it's negative or positive? So to set the, the prelude for that, we need to understand um, to understand today's topic, you need to understand the idea of submission. Submission in Islam is the greatest thing. Islam is submission. That's where we get our name from. The believer is one who submits to Allah Azza wa Jal. And the name of our faith comes from the submission of Ibrahim alayhi salam. His submission in his life to Allah Azza wa Jal was so incredible that Allah was so impressed by his devotion, his submission, that he basically named the entire faith after him. He gave us all our rituals after him. He gave us all of our customs after him. Allah says, مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا Ibrahim did not belong to any faith tradition, neither Jewish nor Christian. But he had two qualities. And those two qualities, Hanif and Muslim. Hanif means one who rejects everything other than Allah. And Muslim, one who submits to Allah. Hanif and Musliman is La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha is Hanif. So Hanif means Ibrahim looked at the stars and said, this might be my Lord. Then the star said, he said, no, la uhibbul afilin. These cannot be my Lord. This cannot be the source of power. And he looked at the sun, he looked at all, he rejected all of those because of his pure nature. He was Hanif, he rejected every single thing in the world. And then he accepted Allah. When he accepted Allah, he was a submitter. He was Muslim. So the Muslim in the Quran is a quality Allah uses to describe the incredible uh, position and, and behavior of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And it's something he wants from all human beings. So he named our faith after him. As, and Allah says, Hu samakumul muslimina min qablu wa fi hadha. He's talking about Ibrahim. He said, just as Ibrahim was a submitter, now we have made you a nation of those who submit to Allah Azza wa Jal. So anyway, the topic for tonight is not submission. But submission is, to understand submission, look at the life of Ibrahim. Submission has a sense of immediacy. Allah says, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah is describing Ibrahim. That whenever Allah said to him, submit, immediately his response was, I submit to the Lord of the world. قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Immediate, without any hesitation. So, the topic for tonight is the opposite of submission. What is the opposite of submission? There is no clear word that denotes the opposite of submission, but there are many things that are on the other side of submission. They detract from submission. They detract from the idea of submission. And one of those is asking too many questions. So for that, let us examine a passage in the Quran where Allah speaks about Bani Israel, where Musa commanded them to slaughter a cow. This is a very important passage. Um, sometimes we read over these passages and we think, oh, that's Bani Israel, nothing to do with us. That's uh, these people, you know, they were cursed or they did this or that. But there's a reason Allah shares their stories in the Quran. There's a reason we're instructed to read them. There's a reason for that. And when you read their stories, you find that many of us are following in the same footsteps. We're following in the same footsteps, following in the same pitfalls. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تَذْبَحُوا بَقَرَةً When Musa said to his people, Your Lord, Allah verily commands you to slaughter a cow. Musa gave a command to his people, you are to sacrifice a cow. Now his people, had they listened at that moment, 
grabbed any cow and slaughtered it, Allah would have been happy. They would have fulfilled the command. Had they been like Ibrahim, Allah commands something. This is Allah commanding, not Musa. Musa says, Inna Allah ya'muru kum an tadbahu bakara. So the believer, is, when he hears a command from Allah, the solution, the attitude, atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul. We obey Allah. Qala aslam tu li Rabbil immediately. But that's not how their attitude was. So what did they say? They said, Qala atattakhiduna huzuwa. What does that mean? That means, are you kidding me? Literally. That's the right translation. I was looking at all the English translations. No one uses that. But in, that's the proper translation. They said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding us? Or seriously? Or something like that? So they, this is what their response was to Musa. So to understand like, the significance of the cow, I mean, we don't have time for that. But the, the first thing you need to understand is you know, the influence of a society. Bani Israel was, was, was under the t tremendous influence of the culture and society of their time. One of the prevailing cultures in the time was e this idea of cow veneration. Um, if you look at any, if you go to any of the museums that have ancient Egypt on display, and I was visiting one in New York City, I was surprised it was a King Tut exhibit. And they had all these uh, artifacts from that time, pharaonic times. But when you look through all the displays, I was surprised to see almost every other display had something of a cow a golden calf, or this or that. And this has nothing to do with Bani Israel. This is a pharaonic culture. So that culture, there was something about the cow that was venerated in that culture. And Bani Israel became under the influence of that culture. So they were like chameleons. They had inferiority complexes. They absorbed the prevailing customs and traditions of their time. And that's why you can understand the significance of the command when Allah asked them to slaughter a cow. It's much deeper than that, just the, any cow. It wasn't a random command. So anyway, they didn't have confident, independent mindsets, Bani Israel. They were constantly under the influence. They were always second-guessing themselves. They were always doubting. And they were frequently asking questions. So when they received this command, they found it very difficult. So the first thing they said, are you kidding us? Are you joking with us? And what did Ibrahim, uh, Musa salam say? قَالَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ He said, I seek refuge in Allah. I'm not kidding. This is serious. This is a command from Allah. I would never joke about the commands of Allah. And then, so, when you look at the answer, um, you see this kind of hesitation, right? Are you joking with us? Instead of submitting immediately, um, they kind of put some distance. They were just kind of asked, okay, what is this about? So that's the opposite of submission. In this whole story, I want you to think about Ibrahim and the submission and our faith, what it demands, and this attitude. You know, how it fares when you compare it to the attitude of Islam or submission. So then they said this. What is the next thing they said? They said, okay, um, ask your Lord what kind of cow it should be. Ask your Lord what kind of cow it should be. So from this statement, you can see that they weren't full submitters. Why did they say your Lord? Of course, he's their Lord too. Musa is their prophet. Is that how you treat a prophet? Is that how you, you know, express yourself when you're part of a faith? So they weren't really belonging to the faith. They were so hesitant. At every moment of, of their interaction with Musa, you see this hesitancy. So ask your Lord... They put some distance between themselves and the command. Instead of saying, well, we're believers, our Lord commands us to do this, we got to do this. No. Ask your Lord what kind of cow it should be. So this is another aspect of their hesitation. That was the first question. So they put this tremendous distance between themselves and, and, and Musa. And you might say, okay, that's a terrible thing, but don't we find Muslims today doing the same thing? There are Muslims in every society. Every Muslim society in the world has this huge uh, backdrop in the culture of these secular type people who hate religion. And they, yet they're still Muslim. So they're always bashing Islam. Why does your Quran say that? That's the kind of question they ask the Imams. Why does your Quran say this? That the women inherits half the man or so on. And so all these misconceptions they have. From the questions you can see it's the same kind of attitude all the time. 
online, if you look at the online forums that imams are being asked questions, there are so many people that ask these types of questions. You can sense from them that there's this indifference, that there's this distance between them and the guidance of Allah Azza wa Jal. Why does your Quran say this? Why do your imam say this? Why does your fiqh say this? It's the same exact thing. So you'll find that every step of this story of Bani Israel and all the stories of Bani Israel, you know, it's something that we find many Muslims falling into. So that's the danger of that. So they said, ask your Lord what kind of cow it should be. So Musa, he said, قَالَ إِنَّهُ يَقُولُ إِنَّهَا بَقَرَةٌ لَا فَارِضٌ وَلَا بِكْرٌ so he kind of collected himself and he said, Look, your Lord commands that it should be a cow. The first thing, it should be a cow. But it should be faridun wala bikrun awanun bayna dalik. Not too old, not too young, but somewhere in between. So you can see every question they're asking, the 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 choice is getting more and more restricted. And that's the nature of questioning. That's a deep lesson here. The more you ask questions, the more difficult your life will become. When we're talking about this, this type of questioning, had they slaughtered a cow right in the beginning, any cow, it would have sufficed. But now they ask, okay, describe the cow to us. So Musa said, okay, it's a cow, but not too old, not too young, somewhere in the middle. And then Musa advised, فَفَعَلُوا مَا تُؤْمَرُونَ So do as you are commanded. Musa is that patient prophet, that mentor of his people, so patient with his people. And look, this is what it should be, so go ahead and do what you are commanded. So what did they say? We know the questions kept coming. Then they said, Ask your Lord what color it should be. What kind of question is that? Like, what difference would that make? Like, Inside, the cows are the same. What difference would an external color be? But that's their next question. Tell us the color of the cow. So this questioning is, it goes against the question. And that's, that's the lesson for us. Like the more we ask questions, like these types of questions, that's the opposite of submitting. When Allah commands you to do something, you do it. But when you start asking so many questions and questions, then it's less likely that you're going to do what you are commanded. So what color? What was the answer of Musa? قَالَ إِنَّهُ يَقُولُ إِنَّهَا بَقَرَةٌ صَفْرًا فَاقِعُ اللَّوْنُهَا تَسُرُّ النَّاظِرِينَ He said, okay, the cow should be yellow, pleasing to the eye. So yellow, pleasing to the eye. Now it's getting more restricted. Not too old, not too young, but now the color has to be yellow. Now their choices are getting more and more restricted. What did they say next? The question still came. So they said, قَالُوا دُعُوا لَنَا رَبَّكَ يُبَيِّلْ لَنَا مَا هِي إِنَّ الْبَقَرَةَ شَابَهَ عَلَيْنَا وَإِنَّا إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَمُهْتَدُونَ They said, okay, can you ask your Lord to describe the cow even more for us? Because all the cows look alike for us. It's kind of hard for us to distinguish cows. So give us more details and you will find, inshallah, that we will be guided. So now this is like their third line of questioning. And so they're asking Musa, give us even more details. It wasn't enough what they were given so far. So now Musa says, and this is the final round, قَالَ إِنَّهُ يَقُولُ إِنَّهَا بَقَرَةٌ لَا ذَلُولٌ تُثِيرُ الْأَرْضَ وَلَا تَسْقِ الْحَرْفِ مُسَلَّمَةٌ لَا شِيَةَ فِيهَا قَالُوا الْآنَ جِئْتَ بِالْحَقِّ فَذَبَحُوهَا وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَلُونَ So Musa said, okay, now the cow should be one that has not been domesticated, not, you know, subjected to tilling the earth and watering the, the crops. So a cow that's wild, that's not domesticated, okay? Doesn't, you know, you haven't used the cow in the fields, okay? And then, مُسَلَّمَةٌ لَا شِيَةَ فِيهَا Also a cow that has no physical defect. No wound on its body, no physical defect. So you're getting more and more restricted. Now they found themselves too ashamed to ask more questions. They said, قَالُوا الْآنَ جِئْتَ بِالْحَقِّ فَذَبَحُوهَا وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَنُونَ They said, okay, now you brought the truth. As if 
Previously it wasn't the truth. Now you brought the truth and then they finally slaughtered the cow. Allah doesn't give us the details, but finally they slaughtered, they found a cow that matched, they slaughtered it. But Allah says, وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَلُونَ They almost did not do it. So this is what happens with questioning. When you ask too many questions, uh, it's not a good thing in general. It's something that it goes against action. You know, it goes against the idea of listening, responding, obeying, and doing what you're supposed to do. When you ask questions, it puts a, 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 an obstacle uh, in the path of that. And when you ask too many questions, this is the end result. You almost wind up not doing it. And often, many people don't do things. Um, they wind up not doing what they're asking about. So, this idea of excessive questioning is very, very important. So, Allah does not like it. It's not something that is um, good in the Quran and in the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ in a sound hadith from Bukhari and Muslim, he said, Inna Allah kariha lakum thalatha. Allah hates from you people three things. Three qualities Allah hates. Qila wa qal, wa kathratu suwal, wa idaratul mal. One of them is qila wa qal, gasir. Just talking about things that have no value, no concern for you. Number two, kathratu suwal, asking too many questions. Wa idaratul mal, and wasting your wealth and frivolous things. So these are three tremendously uh, bad qualities for a society uh, Allah does not like. And if you look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they rarely ask questions. If you look at all the hadith that have the questions, where someone comes, Ya Rasulullah, what's the best deed? Ya Rasulullah, give me one action I can hold on to, one deed I can hold on to, one statement I can hold on to. All those questions are not coming from the companion. They're coming from the random A'rab, the Bedouins coming from far away, who weren't raised and trained by the Prophet ﷺ. They, they were outsiders. So they came and they only interacted with the Prophet once or twice. They asked the questions and they left. And because the companions, they were trained not to ask questions. Abu Bakr did not ask questions. Omar did not ask questions. The big great companion did not ask questions. They were silent in the company of the messenger. They absorbed what they learned and they used their minds to think what they were commanded to do and they did it. But you don't find them asking, okay, how long should the rakahs be? Okay, how, how should I do this? How should I do that? It's rare. I mean, they did ask questions for sure, but it's rare. Most of the questions in the sunnah you'll find coming from not the major companions, from outside, outsiders, people who lived in the outskirts, people who didn't live with the Prophet ﷺ, because he trained them to be like that. Kathratu suwal is not a good thing. It goes against obedience. Um, there's a great hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in the Arba'een of Imam al nawawi the ninth hadith. And this is the most important hadith on this topic. It's something that teaches us so many things. But this hadith is in greater detail in Sahih Muslim. And this hadith is something you need to reflect over and think about. Um, so one day, the companion Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says, Khatabana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day the messenger is giving us a khutbah. It might have been a Jum'ah khutbah, it might have been another talk. But one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was delivering an address to the people. فَقَالْ أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ قَدْ فَرَضَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ الْحَجْ فَحُجُّوا He said, O oh people, Allah has made hajj obligatory for you, so perform the hajj. This is a command, just like Musa's command. It was a command... Allah has made hajj obligatory for you, so do the hajj. All the companions sitting there, they didn't ask questions. They're, they were silent. They knew what it meant, and they were ready to obey. But someone in the audience who was an outsider, فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ So a man raised his hand immediately and said, أَكُلَّ عَامٍ يَا رَسُولَ Allah." Is that every year, O Messenger of Allah? So like, is it obligatory every year? And the Prophet Sakata, he was silent. He did not answer him. The man asked again. The Prophet did not answer. The man asked again. Uh, so he asked three times. And you see the Prophet was not answering. He didn't like the question. Because it goes against the idea of submission. When you have a command come to you, and you respond with a question, that's very bad manners with the commands of, from Allah and His Messenger. So then when the Prophet was obliged, finally he, asked the, he answered the question. Uh, it may have been after his address, it may have been immediately, we don't know. 
He said, لو قلت نعم لوجبت ولا ما استطعتم. He said to the man, look, if I had said yes to you, it would have been obligatory every year and you would not have been able to do it. That's what happens with this nature of excessive questioning. Then he gave some beautiful advice. He said, ذروني ما تركتكم فإنما هلك الذين من كان قبلكم بكثرة سوالهم. So he said, leave me with what I give you. So suffice with what I give you. Because the people before you were destroyed because of their excessive questioning, وَاخْتِلَافِهِمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ And they're differing with their prophets. Again, he's referring to Bani Israel primarily, what they were doing with Musa alayhi salam. And then he said, فَإِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ If I command you with something, do it to the best of your ability as much as you can. And don't ask questions. وَإِذَا نَهَيْتَكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَدَعُوهُ When I command you to avoid something, avoid it. And that's the end of the hadith. This is a beautiful hadith. The Prophet is reminding the companions and us. And when Allah commands something, you just do it. Do it to the best of your ability. Don't ask too many questions. Don't ask, okay, should it be like this or that? Or what if I don't do this? What if I can only do this? Just do it. Just answer. Just respond. That's, you know, Islam, submission. If قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The model of Ibrahim is very important. Allah commanded something, he did it immediately without hesitation. <coughs> so, asking too many questions is, is, is not a good thing. In the Quran, Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 101 and 102. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا عَنْ أَشْيَاءَ إِن O you who believe, do not ask questions whose answers, if they were to come, it would cause you great pain and hardship. Allah is commanding the believer, do not ask questions. So, you know, obviously, it's not every question, but it's predominantly, you know, what we're talking about here. But the verse, Allah is saying, do not ask questions, O you who believe, because if the answers were given to you, it would cause you great hardship. وَإِن تَسْأَلُوا عَنْهَا حِينَ يُنَزَّلُ الْقُرْآنُ تُبَدَ لَكُمْ If you are to ask while the Prophet is being revealed the Qur'an, perhaps an answer will come to you and make your life difficult. So just relax, take it easy, and just follow the commands of Allah and His Messenger. That's what a Muslim does. Not ask too many questions to make things difficult for you. And then the next verse, what does it say? عَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ حَلِيمٌ Actually, that's the end of the first verse. Allah forgives from you so much because he's Al-Ghafoor, Al-Halim. And then Allah says, قَدْ سَأَلَهَا قَوْمٌ مِّن قَبْلِكُمْ ثُمَّ أَصْبَحُوا بِهَا كَافِرُونَ Kafirin. Before you, many people ask questions, the nations, and through their questioning, they became disbelievers. They rejected the message. That was the ultimate trajectory that the questioning led them to. First, it leads them to delay in obedience, delay in submission, and they almost, they do things, but they almost don't do them. But then other people keep asking questions, they wind up not doing things. They wind up rejecting them. They become kafirin. So this is very, very important. Here's another hadith um, where the Prophet ﷺ, and this is again, it's in Sahih Bukhari. He said, Inna jurman, The greatest criminal among the Muslims. Man sa'ala an shay'in, um, لَمْ يُحْرِمْ فَحُرِّمَ مِنْ أَجْلِ مَسْأَلَتِهِ He asks about something that is not forbidden for you, but because of those questions it becomes forbidden. Now, this doesn't apply to us today because the revelation stopped. Right? But this is, you can tell, in the time of the companions, when the Prophet was alive, وسلم, this was a possibility. So, the Messenger did not like those questions because he did not know what Allah would say. And that is why, for instance, like you find all the examples in his life, like the Taraweeh, we just prayed Taraweeh. The Prophet did not pray Taraweeh with his companions. He didn't want to. Because he was afraid that it would become obligatory or Allah would make it an obligation. So he went to the masjid, prayed on his own. And then people saw and they silently followed him. And then by the second day, he started noticing people are following. When he noticed people are following him, he went home, closed the door, he didn't come out again for the rest of Ramadan. And then the people asked him, oh, where were we? We were waiting. He said, I was afraid that Allah would make this obligatory. The messenger is a merciful messenger. He wants ease for his people and his ummah. 
He wants them to have the bare, you know, like the obligation should be kept at a minimum so we can practice them, right? So he wasn't keen on, on adding too many things in the deen. So this is very, very important. Asking too many questions. Now, getting practical, like how do we practically apply that to our lives? Um, as believers now, you know, the Quran is no longer being revealed. So there are many instances and, you know, uh, you have to tread carefully. Um, there are a lot of things that we're involved in in various communities that um, people feel strongly about. And so, but I'll share with, let me limit myself to the sunnah and you can read between the lines. So Aisha radiallahu in Sahih Bukhari is an incredible hadith. Something, a hadith that almost probably no one ever heard of. It's a hadith uh, where Aisha radiallahu anha, she says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, she said, Huna, huna unasun hadithu bi ahdin bi shirk. There are many new Muslims in our community. They just became Muslim. And, you know, Ya'tunana bi luhman. They send us food to eat. And luhman is meat. He said, these new Muslims, they send us meat to eat, right? And la nadri yathkuruna smallahi alayhi amla. We don't know, did they slaughter the meat properly? Or did they mention the name of Allah or not? Who's speaking here? Aisha. Aisha. Where is this hadith? Sahih al-Bukhari. Should there be any doubt about this? No. So she said, look, there are new Muslims, we don't know if they slaughtered the meat properly. Okay? Um, we don't know if they mention Allah's name or not. Maybe they don't know the rules. What should we do with that meat that comes to us? What do you think the Prophet said? He said, Uthkuru antum ismallahi fakulu. You mention the name of Allah and eat it. That's what he said. He said, don't ask too many questions. That was the attitude. Asking too many, this is practical. This is not about revelation now, but now in your deen, in your practice, the more you ask questions about things like that, the more difficult it would become, right? Because now if you start getting into the details, now things become more and more difficult. And this topic, you know, I was inspired to this topic. Like there's meat that comes to our house now. People drop off, uh, not meat, but food. And now often I start noticing in the messages, like this is from such and such, may Allah bless you. By the way, we got the meat from this store. So now that's the messages in these little, uh, so there's a trend now, people are so particular about where they get their meat from. So this is Sahil Bukhari, this is the greatest, this is our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, this is the Prophet sallallahu guidance. What does that teach us? It teaches us we shouldn't be asking too many questions in our deen, because some things are not that important. The things that are important are the core values of the deen, usul al-deen, that's taqwa, that's tahara, that's things like that. But these minor details of, you know, like wudu and purity and slaughtering meat and things like that, these are minor things. They're important in the deen, but in the scheme of the deen, they're not usul al-deen. So in these minor things, the Prophet always advised people to not ask questions and just overlook things in those branches of faith, the branches of the deen. You have usul al-deen and you have furu al-deen. Usul al-deen are the core fundamentals, the things the Quran talks about. 80% of the Quran is about taqwa. It's about, you know, uh, tahara, tawheed, and shirk. These things, no compromise. Tahara means like, uh, or, or tahu, this idea of tahara is that you earn your wealth from halal sources. This is not a furur. This is usul ad -deen. Here, there's no compromise. So when it comes to like jobs, for instance, people ask questions, is this job lawful or not? There, you have to be extra careful. Because if your income is unlawful, that's a serious thing. That's usul ad -deen. But on the other matters like wudu, did I you know, do the wudu properly, did I miss something? Here shaitan will come to you and bring in the form of waswas or in the form of ta'ammuk. Ta'ammuk is delving into the details of fiqh. Ta'ammuk is something evil. Ta'ammuk is something that was a crime of Bani Israel. They were so nitpicking into the details of the rules of their religion that, became, that their religion became the rules. So. To understand that, you have to understand the Jews and the Christians. Just a brief like, uh, word about the Jews and the Christians. There are two things in religion. There's purpose and there's structure. <coughs> purpose and structure. Every faith, every religion has to have a purpose. That's the end goal. And then there's a structure. That means there's rules, there's regulations, there's things you have to do. So 
What happened with Bani Israel, they focused on the rules so much that they forgot the purpose. And the purpose is taqwa. You know, you do things for Allah Azza wa Jal. And the structure is the rules, the ahkam. So they became so nitpicking into the minutia of their deen that they developed all these laws and they just forgot about the, the, the purpose of the deen. So what happened, Allah sent Isa salam to remind his people and he was from Bani Israel. He reminded those people who are of the followers of Musa that look, the rules are not as important as you make them out to be. More important is the love of Allah. More important is believing in Allah. So that's the reminder that he gave them because he was pushing back against the excessive uh, structure that they were focusing on. But then what happened, the Christians, what did they do? They took that message of Jesus, they exaggerated, they made it all on purpose and they got rid of the structure. So Jews today, they have structure but no purpose in their faith. And the Christians, they have purpose, love of God, but no structure, no laws, no rules. So that's the, the two extremes of the previous faith traditions. And as Muslims, we have to have purpose and we have to have structure. We do everything with taqwa, we, have to have, we know why we're doing things. And that's, that's very important, the tazkiyat nafs the khushur and the salah, the understanding of the Qur'an that we're talking about, that's the purpose. But then the structure is also important, where we have to pray five times a day. So among Muslims, we have people that fall into both traps. And Shah Waliullah rahimahullah was a great scholar, and he, 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 he says very controversial things, but very deep and insightful things. He said like, so he talks about in his book, Fawz al-Kabir, um, he talks about that the Qur'an refutes four different groups. The Jews, the Christians, the hypocrites, and the mushrikeen. And he says these four groups are not just particular groups in, uh, in history, but they're templates of human behavior that we have to avoid. The reason Allah shares their stories and refutes them is because the danger of all of us falling into those same patterns. And at the end of each, he says, if you have a doubt about that, he said, if you want to see the modern day Christians in the Muslim community, look at these people. And he said, if you want to see the modern day Jews in the Muslim community, look at these people. So what was he doing there at the end of those sections? He was saying, like all the ayat about the Nasara, and, you know, well, the problems they went into, that Allah de refused their deviation. Where do you find that in the Muslim community, that kind of behavior? Not saying that those are Christians, he's just saying that kind of behavior, falling in the same trap. He said the people who visit the shrines of holy men, because these are, you can say, some of the, the saint worship and some of the, you can say, some of the Sufis in the Muslim community today. And this is Shah Waliullah speaking. Because if you look at their patterns, they pride themselves on their attachment to these great figures that often they don't practice the Sharia. They say, we don't need the Sharia. Through the Shafa of these people, we'll be saved. So they took the purpose, they left the structure. So that's Christianity. So for Shah deal, these are the modern day Christians in the Muslim community. These extreme Sufis that venerate the shrines and they give up the Sharia. Not all of them, but the ones that do that. But then on the other side, who are the modern day Jews in the Muslim community? That's very interesting. He said, he used the word fuqaha. Not all fuqaha. He used the word fuqaha. He said, first he said the ulama usu, the scholars that frequent the gates of the rulers. They do everything the rulers want them to do. They just create the deen to meld in with to whatever the ruler or, the, or the, the statesman, the person running the show, he wants. And secondly, those scholars, the fuqaha, he used the word fuqaha, that make the ammuk. They delve into the details, the minutia of the deen so much that they follow the path of the Jews. And that's exactly what Bani Israel did. They wanted to, if you look at kosher law today, it's incredible. Like, you know, halal rules are so easy. But if you look at kosher laws and kosher, you know, you can't use certain utensils with certain foods. You have to have separate dishes for dairy, separate dishes for meat. You can't cook this and this in the same time. So many minute details. And that's what the Quran is saying. Through their questioning, we made their religion so hard for them. And then Isa was sent to lift some of those burdens and restrictions. So that's what happens when you have, when you delve into the deen with ta'amuk, with the details of fiqh with ta'amuk. If you get into too much detail. Allah commands you to do certain things, you do it. He commands you to, you know, eat halal, you eat halal as much as you can. But delving into in such minute detail, 
that you forget other things. And that's, that's what always happens. You might be thinking, okay, but isn't it important to follow the rules and laws? Yes. But when you get into ta'amuk, you violate other rules. And there are so many examples. People, they don't care about so many things, but they'll care about the halal meat issue. So, you know, this is, this is a problem. That's what happens because the human mind is limited. If you don't have the balance of sharia and the balance of the deen, then you're not going to be able to see everything. When you f excessively focus on one thing, you miss other things. That's always the case. So the deen, you have to focus on usul al-deen. And today's lesson is about not asking too many questions in the deen. So may Allah give us that kind of attitude of submission to Allah's way and in the way of the prophets and give us that tawfiq to follow the way of the prophets and the early Muslims and not to fall into the traps that all of these different traditions fell into. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We can still have Q&A session, right? So I can't say today, I can't get myself to say if anyone has questions after that talk. But you're free to do what you need to do. I just have one question. Like, how do we, how do the layman like differentiate or understand the usul al-deen versus the, what term did you use? Furu al-deen. Like, I, you, I know you mentioned it yourself, like, wudu is important because salah will, will be the first thing we're going to be talked about. Or your halal food, the duas are not going to get accepted if you don't eat halal. So, it's important for people, so how do we differentiate? So, that's an excellent question. What's the difference? How do you know the difference between usuluddin and furuuddin? Usuluddin are those major topics in the Quran that Allah speaks about. Like taqwa, how many verses? Ittaqullaha. Again and again, things like that. Um, but then, so those are the goals of religion. Shirk, Tawheed, and Taqwa, and Shukr, and all of these things. These are Usul al no compromise on those. Furur al-Din are those commands in the Quran that lead to other things. So an example would be, what do you think Salah is? You just pray Salah. Salah is Usul al or Furur al -Din? Why? Exactly. So, أقيم الصلاة لذكري. Allah commands us to pray so you can remember Allah. Usul al-Din here is dhikr. But the furu al-Din is salah. And furu al-Din actually, so this, is, this comes from Shah Wadiullah. Furu al-Din is major branches and minor branches. So there's actually furu al-Din al-Kubra, like salah, and furu al-Din al-Sughra, like wudu. So basically, in this scheme, just this act, the ultimate goal of salah is dhikr, right? Dhikr is suluddin. Salah is furur din al-kubra, the major branch of faith. It's still important. The Quran speaks about it, but not as much as it speaks about suluddin. And then the thing that leads you to salah is wudu. And that's furur din al-sughra. That's a minor branch. And wudu, when it comes to the Quran, so when suluddin, every page of the Quran is filled with it. Furur din, 82 verses, aqim al-salah. 82 verses, thousands. And wudu, how many verses about wudu? Two. It's the same verse repeated, right? So it's a, the same, same verse repeated in two places. So it's a, the same idea, but same command, but like in two verses. So you can see, thousands, 82, two. That gives you the Quranic priorities. Quranic priorities of Surah Deen, and then Furur Deen and Kubra, they're also very important. It's not to say that they're not important, but they're less important than Usul al-Din. So if you're praying and you're worried about the rules of Salah and the Arkan of Salah, is my Salah valid? And you haven't even thought about Allah in the whole Salah. You have no dhikr, but you have all the fiqh of Salah. So you violated Usul al-Din, but you focus on the fiqh of Salah and you got all the sunnahs right and you put your hand in the right spot. So that's the whole point here. The reality is the Prophet, it wasn't important where you put your hands in Salah. When you focus on the details of Salah, it becomes very important. Is this the right way or is this the right way? Is your hand up here or hand down here? All those things become more important when you don't have the prophetic balance. But these things were not important. The fact that they were not important, that's why Allah's Messenger commanded His companions to pray. What did He say? Qumu lillahi qanitin. Allah says in the Quran, stand before Allah in prayer. But he didn't command, okay, stand like this, put your hands like this, seven bones on the ground. Those things are good. They're books of fiqh. They're, they're guidelines, but they're not what it's about. That's not what the Prophet taught. You now the companions, they looked at the Prophet, they made their ishtihad. Okay, we saw the Prophet one day holding his hands like this, and 
Different companions came up with their ishtihad, this is what the sunnah is. But the fact that there's no clear hadith of the Prophet ﷺ on these specific details means it was not important, purposely so. Because the Prophet's focus was usul ad din And then the companions, they took the usul ad din and then they didn't really focus on these details and these differences. Later Muslims, what happens is we love differences, we love details, we love fiqh, we love these things. So we started, you know, fighting over these matters. And now there's actually, people, there, there are physical fights, there are, you know, all sorts of conflict in Muslim communities over matters that are not even important. It doesn't even matter which one do you pick. So it's not important what that is. So, uh, these details are not that important because they're not usul al-deen. They're not even furu al-deen al-kubra. They're furu al-deen al-subra, the exact positions and prayer and things like that. Ada, Allahu a'lam. Biggest what? Biggest reason for these imbalances. Of, uh, I'm assuming because there's not a proper system of a teacher, student, and most people's lives nowadays, like or resources, mentorship, or uh, how to get that balance. I mean, part of it is human nature. That's why the previous nations fell into that trap, and their scripture was not preserved, so they kept those mistakes. So part of it is human nature. We 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 love differences. We love what distinguishes us from others. Part of it is we love details because you can't talk about taqwa. What are you going to talk about in taqwa, in salah, khushur? You have to have khushur in salah. But you can talk about the details and list like all the rules and regularly have a fiqh of prayer class and they're so popular, or fiqh of this or fiqh of that. But these are the minute rules and regulations. So people just love details and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that if you navigate it properly, if you have the usul ad in mind. But when you violate usul ad then so my message here is not that the rules are not important, that fiqh is not important. Of course, that's not my message. But the message is when it becomes excessively important, it violates usul ad din And then you lost the balance. So it wasn't excessively important to the early generation. Early generation didn't care about the purity matters that much. Later generation became obsessed with matters of purity and wudu and things like that. So all the books of fiqh are filled with those masail. But the, if you look at the early books of fiqh, or the early books or early statements of companions, it was very different. Like, let me give you an example of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab was someone who hated questions. And on matters of fiqh, he always discouraged questions. So one day he was walking in the street, and, you know, with some companions, they walked by a house, and there was some water that fell off the house and fell onto the clothes of those people. So his companion, um, he knocked on the door, he said, you know, whoever lives here, what, what was the source of this water? I need to know if it's najis or not. And Omar, he knocked on the door, he was standing right there, he said, whoever's here, do not answer him. <laughs> do not answer him, let's keep walking. So this is Omar ibn al-Khattab, because if you find out and it's najis, what are you going to do? Now you have to go home, change your clothes, puts you in difficulty. These are things that are not as important as we make them out to be. So if you're not sure if it's najis or not, you assume that it's not najis, because that's the norm. And another time, Amr ibn al-As and Umar ibn al-Khattab, they're traveling, they come to a water hole. And these are all in the books of fiqh, the early books of fiqh. So this is on the issue of the purity of water. We were teaching fiqh of purification according to Hanafi school prior to Ramadan. That's why these examples are fresh in my mind. So there's an idea, okay, if there's a watering hole, right, is the water pure? What if dogs drink from that water? What if like wild animals like tigers or you know, they drink from that water? So there's a debate over whether the water becomes najis or not. So Amr ibn al-As, they came, they traveled to a region, they came to a watering hole and all his companions, they needed to make wudu. They came to that water and they were starting to make wudu. So Amr, he asked some of the locals, and he asked, can you tell us what kind of animals come to this water, watering hole? Are there wild beasts that come and drink from this watering hole? And Omar was there, he heard, and he said, do not answer him. He said, don't tell him. Because we used to make wudu from all types of uh, sources of water, and even there are wild animals there. So Omar always discouraged that kind of deep questioning about like, matter that will make your life, life difficult. So now, how do you approach that in your life? How, how do you navigate that? That's a personal decision for each and every one of you, of course. You want to be as exact as possible. That's a good thing, that's part of taqwa, being careful and sure. But try to keep these balanced, these priorities in mind. Usul al-Din more important, Furu al-Din al-Kubra less important. Um, also important but less important, and Furu al-Din al-Sughra very extremely uh, unimportant. Here, you know, many mistakes are ma'fu'an. 
many lapses, Allah's Messenger uh, would advise his companions, don't worry about that. Like wudu, for instance, wudu is sughra. So there was a companion, he asked the Prophet, I don't know if I'm in wudu or not, I'm not sure if I broke my wudu. So, and he would go and make his wudu. So the Prophet said, do not go and make your wudu again, unless you are sure, unless you hear a sound or you uh, smell. So unless you hear those sounds, even if you hear like something in your stomach and you're not sure, it might have happened, leave it. Why? Because wudu is not as important. It's furur din as sughra. So here it's not as important as you think it is. So the Prophet was advising his command, don't, don't worry about it. Unless you're absolutely sure, do not uh, leave that place and make wudu again. But on a matter of taqwa or a matter of shirk, in shirk you need to be sure. In shirk, if there's something that might not be, that might be close to shirk, or might be resembling shirk, you leave it. So that, that's something there's no compromise on. So if you have these priorities in mind, your life would be much more balanced. Wallahu ta'ala a'am. Yes. <coughs> So Jews, Christians, and then there's Mushrikeen, and then there's uh, Munafiqeen. Uh, so those who took my class, you remember the examples? Or the Mushrikeen. Mushrikeen, I believe, are those who sit at the grave steps of the shrines, I believe, the otad of the shrines. So if, if I'm not mistaken, so um, some of the Muslims that do shrine worship, right, grave worship, they're at the... You know, they're actually making dua to the graves and things like that. Uh, Munafiqeen, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is... Um, no, okay, I'm going to abstain on that one. It might have been the scholars that frequent the rulers, but he also mentioned that among the, the, the Jews, ulama su. But I can bring that to you tomorrow, inshallah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Like how, how much questioning is allowed and how much... There has to be some level, of course, right? You have to practice your deen, especially in a country like this. So you need to ask some questions to some extent. Like, when you, like if I buy vitamins or buy some uh, medicine, I often look at the ingredients. That's a good thing. We should be doing that. Because often the ingredients, they come from pork, you know, pork sign source. So generally, um, you know, you're supposed to try your best to practice the deen. But then, how far do you go, right? Like you can understand like the psychology of people who are afflicted by OCD and waswas. Like there's never any end to that. So there has to be some point in your mind that you stop. You know what, this is my best way I'm practicing the deen. This is what I understand from the Quran and Sunnah. I'm not going to ask any more questions. This is what it is. But if you're asking about the ta'am of Ahlul Kitab, so that, you know, is a, uh, you know, it's a deep issue, like is uh, the, the meat of Ahlul Kitab allowed or not? Um, you know, I can only give you my opinion. My opinion is that every nation was given a law. If they mention Allah's name, then it's allowed. But today, the Christians, it doesn't apply anymore because they got rid of the law. So they don't mention Allah's name. They don't sl slaughter properly. So my opinion, Christian, there's no such thing as Christian meat today. So it would not be allowed. Kosher, you have to see if kosher... Um, they do mention the name of God. Generally, they do. The kosher regulations are very similar to halal regulations. They remove all the meat. They cut from the, the same vein. So, um, so most scholars' opinion, yeah, the Quran allows it, and we, we, are, we cannot be in a position to not allow it. Um, so it, is, it would be allowed if it's kosher and they're following their laws. Um, there are many types of kosher that you have to kind of see if they're following their laws, and it's the, God's name is mentioned at the time of slaughter. So that is... Uh, generally the predominant view. Um, again, there's going to be many details and many differences, and I'm not one to get into differences like that. Yes, of course. Of course. So, kathratu masailim, right? Kathratu masailim, asking too many questions. But what I was trying to build up in the beginning, just to give you the idea, when you ask questions, it goes against submission. But then, you also have to understand, you have to ask questions. And there's one verse in the Quran that questioning is positive. What's that verse? Where Allah asks you to ask questions. Yes. 
Yeah, fas'alu ahla dhikri in kuntum la ta'lam. If you don't know, ask the people a reminders. Here Allah is commanding you to ask. So of course it's a balance. It's not that you can't ask any question, but generally the spirit of questioning is against the spirit of submission. And which questions are allowed and not allowed that you have to figure out. Excessive questioning is not allowed. Questioning on things that will make life difficult is not allowed. Sometimes, you know, there's, there are cases where you might see that there's a community, everyone's involved in something, and you might have a feeling this might not be right. So if you raise your hand in the community, there's a thousand people sitting there, you, and everyone's wearing, like there's like 50 people wearing something that might be haram. And you ask a scholar a question, he says, haram, now you made it difficult for 50 people. So maybe here, the best thing is you just mind your own business. You don't do it, and if someone asks you, then you can give your opinion, but volunteering that to everyone, asking in front of everyone, that would make life difficult for the community. That would be perhaps one application. So the main lesson here is, you know, obedience. Obedience is so important. Obedience is so important. And obedience is where Allah's command comes, your answer should be obedience, not questioning. Your answer should not be hesitation or questioning or anything else. There are many implications of that, like zakat. So when zakat is due on you after a year, a lot of people like to hold on to it and give it. Someone asked yesterday, can I take my zakat and give it over the next year? So that goes against the spirit of obedience because after a hole, the zakat is obligatory upon you. It's due upon you immediately. So in that, the spirit of submission will require that you give it immediately. And as we mentioned at least twice, the Prophet so one day was praying after Salah, he ran home, he came back out of breath, and the companions asked what happened. He said, I remember there was some charity in my house, maybe it was a cot or something, and I had to give it away, and I forgot about it. I didn't want to spend an extra moment of my time not doing what is due upon me, not giving what is due upon me. So that's, that's a great example. Same thing with Salah. When the Salah is established, and when the Salah's time comes, now Allah commands you to pray, now it's time for Dhuhr, you should pray earlier rather than later. That's why one of the great virtues the Prophet, somebody asked him was the best virtue. He said, as salatu ala waqtiha. Praying salah early and on his time. So praying salah immediately because it's the command of Allah. Now, we're sitting in the maqam of our dear Mawlana Yusuf al I'll share with you, like before he passed, um, we were driving to New York and I, I, this is something I just noticed from him and I never saw that before. Um, we were driving to New York for a lecture, for a maghrib, right? The lecture was at maghrib. And we were four blocks from the apartment in Brooklyn where he was supposed to give a lecture. And Maghrib sunset came in. So we're four blocks away from the apartment. I'm driving and my father's in the back seat and Mawl is sitting next to us. And sunset, he goes, Allah, and he started praying. And we, we were so surprised. And he prayed the whole Maghrib. And then after he finished, my father asked him, um, you know, we're about to get there. You know, why do you pray Maghrib right now? He said, can you give me a guarantee we'll be alive to pray in the Maghrib when we get to the apartment? This is the kind of attitude of submission. Time comes, you have to pray. Same thing with the Salah. Often when the, when the Salah is established in the Masjid, sometimes we find people praying other Salahs in the back. Like the Fard Salah, Fard. We're talking about Fard, the command of Allah, not the Nafil prayers. So there, you know, there's a Hadith in Sahih Muslim. There's several Hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet Sallallahu said, um, he would advise his companions, When the iqamah is established, there is no salah except the fard prayer. So that's a, that's a you know, that's, and many of the early companions, their view was, so if you have to pray sunnah, for instance, so suppose you come to the masjid, now the fard is established, Allah has commanded you to pray the fard, but you have to pray the sunnah. So should you pray the sunnah or should you join the fard? Which is a priority with this conception in mind? What would you do? So yeah, so based on, based on this evidence and many of the early companions, their view is no, you join the fard right away. And there's clear hadith of the Prophet And I have to mention there are some scholars and even they quote early companions that certain of the muakkadah sunnah, they say, okay, you can pray the sunnahs in the back. You know, so you find many people from where we come from, the salah is being established. So they'll go back and they'll pray their two sunnahs of, like Fajr for instance, they'll pray the Fajr sunnahs and then they'll miss the first rakah of Fajr, Fard. Um, not going to use the word haram, not going to use, but just 
it's more in the spirit of submission, the spirit of many of the early companions used to, when Allah's command comes, you follow immediately. You don't delay. And also, yesterday, um, this brother, um, we came and Salah was established, right? So people were in Sajda, right? The Imam was in Sajda, Imam Abdullah was in Sajda. So we came late and we joined and went to Sajda. He stood up and he stayed for a while until the Imam got up. So, so that is another example where Allah commanded you to pray. It's a fard prayer. Your obligation is to join it immediately. So delaying and hesitation there, waiting for the Imam to come up, that goes against the spirit of submission. So all of these things are applications of, of submission that, that we need. So fard is a priority. When Allah commands you to do something, you do it sooner rather than later, and you prioritize that in your life. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Thank you.